Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Murder Tapes podcast, season three, episode three. I want to quickly say hello to all of my new listeners from TikTok. I really appreciate all of the love and support, and I really hope that you enjoy the show. I'm excited to have you as a listener. I had a really nice weekend because I didn't have to work on the 4th of July or the day before, and I got the weekend off, so that was pretty nice. I got to go restock my groceries and just clean up around my apartment, and yeah. I hope you all had a nice weekend with your family and for all of my listeners in Houston I just want to say that I hope you guys are all doing okay. My family lives in Houston, that's where I'm from, and the hurricane is just horrible. My mom's been without power and a lot of my other family as well, so keeping you on my prayers. As for today's case, we are going to be talking about the Daniel LaPlante case. Daniel LaPlante was born on May 15th, 1970 in Townsend, Massachusetts. And this is so odd because this is actually my mom's birthday, except for the year. But if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, then you know that anytime there's a date involved, I always mention if anyone I know happens to have a birthday on that day or on that day and year. So aside from that, something that I found even weirder was that he actually lived on Elm Street. And if you haven't seen the Nightmare on Elm Street films, then you may not know what I'm referring to, so I'll explain. In the films, the main character's name is Freddy Krueger, and he always wears a bladed leather glove. He preys on teenagers in their dreams, and this kills them in reality. So it's kind of eerie that this killer that would easily give anyone nightmares just so happened to live on Elm Street. Another thing I found to be interesting before we move on is what inspired the films. Because I'm not sure many people are aware of this, but... One story recounts the experience of a refugee child from the Cambodian genocide who feared sleeping because he was afraid he would be attacked in his dreams and never wake up. Wes Craven, the producer of Nightmare on Elm Street, reflected on this heartbreaking scenario. Quote, When he finally did fall asleep, his parents believed the worst was over. But in the middle of the night, they heard screams. And by the time they reached him, he had passed away, lost to a nightmare. Such tragedies were tragically common among Southeast Asian refugees in the 1980s. For those interested in delving deeper, I'll include a link to an article on the subject. Now back to Daniel. His childhood and teenage years were filled with disturbing episodes of alleged sexual and psychological abuse, reportedly inflicted by both his father and later his psychiatrist. His early environment was described as chaotic. The family home and its surroundings were cluttered with junk and old vehicles. Daniel attended St. Bernard's High School in Fitchburg, where he was known as a loner. One of his classmates, named Patrick McGugan, would say, quote, The guy never really was all that friendly. He never liked to go to parties. He never really talked much. Students and faculty characterized him as withdrawn and not particularly sociable. During the 1980s, a neighbor expressed growing concern about Daniel's frequent solo trips into the woods behind his home. Quote, You'd always see him walking out there alone. It seemed like the only place he would go. Daniel was diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder by a psychiatrist who allegedly later abused him. He turned to theft by the age of 15. He began breaking into homes in Townsend during the evenings, stealing valuables including jewelry and money. Gradually, his actions evolved into psychological manipulation. He started leaving items behind and rearranging things inside his neighbors' homes to scare them. By 1986, his behavior had turned into sheer terror when he became fixated on 15-year-old Tina Bowen. Daniel and Tina went to the same school, and he had taken her out on a date over the Easter break. When Tina returned to school after the Easter break, Some of her fellow classmates told her that Daniel was facing rape charges. Her father, Frank Bowen, told her that that was that and assumed he wouldn't see him ever again. Over the course of several weeks in late fall of 1986, Daniel broke into Tina's family residence at 93 Lawrence Street in Pepperell near Townsend. He stayed in a crawl space that was no wider than six inches. While there, he messed with the family psychologically. Tina and her sister often tried to contact their recently deceased mom by using a Ouija board. After witnessing Tina and her sister attempting to communicate with their deceased mother using a Ouija board, Daniel started impersonating a ghost. He manipulated TV channels, rearranged items, mysteriously consumed milk, 
and emptied bottles of alcohol without drinking from them. Disturbing messages like, marry me, and I'm in your room, come find me, were scrawled onto walls using mayonnaise and ketchup, and a knife was used to pin a family photograph to the wall. Initially, Frank Bowen believed his daughters were watching too many scary movies or pranking each other, but he soon discovered the reality was much darker. On December 8, 1986, upon returning home, the girls found evidence that someone had used their toilet. After searching the house, Frank Bowen uncovered Daniel hiding in a wardrobe. His face was painted. He was dressed in a Native American-style jacket and a ninja mask, wielding a hatchet. Daniel then forced them all into a bedroom, but soon ran off because Tina escaped through a window and contacted police. When authorities arrived, they couldn't find Daniel, and the Bowen family was told by him to seek shelter in a nearby hotel. On December 10th, Frank returned home to get some of their belongings, when he noticed a man in the window as he approached the door. When Officer Stephen Bazanson arrived, he noticed a terrifying message. Quote, When I opened the door, on the right-hand wall, I saw a knife sticking out of the wall, and I see it's through a picture, a family picture, written on it in magic marker, I'm still here, come find me. Now the hair goes up on the back of my head. On another wall, I saw another picture saying, I'm going to kill you all with a knife through it. Police found Daniel just two days later in the cellar of Tina's family home. He was hiding in a triangular space in a corner bounded on two sides by the concrete foundation and inner wall. It was clear that he had been living there for weeks. Stephen would say, quote, I pulled my pistol and said, I got the son of a bitch right here, but he didn't move. I told him, let me see your hands or I will splatter your brains all over that wall. He was arrested and held in a juvenile facility until October 1987 and his mother remortgaged her home in order to pay his $10,000 bail. Just two months later, he committed another horrible crime. Daniel was living at home with his mom, awaiting trial, and he continued to rob people during the day. On October 14, 1987, he stole two 22 caliber firearms from one of his neighbors. Then, on November 16, 1987, he burglarized the home of the Gustafson family. They had moved into this home five years prior. According to court documents, he stole a cordless phone and a cable box. The Gustafson family included the mother Priscilla, who was a pregnant nursery school teacher, her husband Andrew, and their two children, five-year-old William and seven-year-old Abigail. Daniel decided to go back once more, and on December 1st, 1987, Daniel began walking through the woods with a 22 firearm. Daniel would later say he didn't expect the family to return home. But according to retired Pepperell Lieutenant Thomas Lane, Daniel thought about jumping out of a window to escape, but instead he approached Priscilla with the gun and forced her and her son to the bedroom. He then put William in the closet and tied Priscilla to the bed using makeshift ligatures and one of his socks to gag her. He then raped Priscilla before putting a pillow over her face and shooting her twice in the head with the gun that he had stole from his neighbor, Raymond Pindell. Her son, William, heard everything, and Daniel told him that she was sleeping. Afterwards, he took William to the bathroom and drowned him. He then decided to leave the home but ran into Abigail because she had just returned home on the school bus. He then lured Abigail into another bathroom and drowned her. After that, he went back home and attended his niece's birthday party that evening, as if it was another normal day. Andrew Gustafson returned home after his calls to Priscilla went unanswered. Their home was eerily quiet and none of the lights were on. He began to panic as he felt something was terribly wrong. Upon entering one of the bedrooms, he found his wife dead, lying face down on the bed. He ran out of the home and immediately called the police. He would tell authorities that he refused to look for their children because, quote, I was afraid I would find them dead. It was so shocking and unbelievable. I screamed. I wailed. Honestly, I'm so glad that he didn't find them the way he found his wife because that type of trauma can eat you up, especially when it is your own kids. Priscilla was last seen alive while picking up William from his babysitter around 1 p.m. She then returned home and was met by Daniel. Daniel told investigators that he normally would leave if he heard people coming in the home, but decided not to that day. Retired police officer George Aho found Abigail in William's bodies, 
in separate bathtubs. When speaking about Abigail, he would say, quote, My feeling at the time was that she had fought to stay alive. Her eighth birthday was the following week. The court documents would show that Daniel was easily identified as the suspect because of forensic evidence. Police found both the wet shirt and gloves he wore when drowning the children behind the Gustafon home. Police dogs used the scent on the shirt to track through the woods within three feet to Daniel's mom's house. In that same evening the murders were committed, Daniel was interrogated. However, due to a lack of evidence, they weren't able to arrest him right then and there. Now you're probably wondering how that's possible considering I just said that they had the shirt and gloves he wore. But unfortunately, in a courtroom, that's not always enough. It's important that multiple pieces of evidence are available in order to convince a jury he's guilty. It's really a case-by-case -case basis because some people like to go for the insanity plea as well. So these things take time. This is also why interrogations are important, because flat-out confessions save a lot of time. They planned on having him back the following day, but Daniel fled, which led a manhunt to ensue. Daniel was found hiding in a dumpster, and was arrested on December 3rd, 1987, after another burglary spree in Pepperell. Once he was arrested, Frank Bowen told police he was angry that he was released in the first place. Quote, If Daniel LaPlante does not get convicted and gets out again, I will personally kill him. You can't imagine what kind of fear we have been living in. He is mentally insane. There is no question about it. And now I am financially broke and emotionally disturbed and trying to put my life together again. He went on to say that he and his daughters lived in fear of Daniel, and after their encounter with him, they vacated their home. Daniel was convicted of all three murders in the Gustafson slayings and was sentenced to life in prison. He remains behind bars in the Massachusetts Correctional Institution in Norfolk. In 2017, Daniel petitioned for release from prison following a change in Massachusetts law granting juvenile offenders sentenced to life imprisonment the chance for rehabilitation. During his resentencing, Daniel expressed remorse for his actions and appealed for a second opportunity. Quote, I cannot adequately convey the gravity of my deeds. I took the lives of three innocent individuals. Because of me, a five-year-old boy will never celebrate his sixth birthday. A seven-year-old girl will never see her eighth year. Because of me, a woman will never give birth to her third child. I deprived an unborn child of its first breath. A husband was forever denied the words, I love you, from his family. I lack the words to fully convey my deep sorrow. Yet I sincerely apologize for the profound harm I have inflicted. From the core of my being, from the depths of my soul, I am sorry. After a psychiatric evaluation, psychiatrist Fabian Saleh observed that Daniel exhibited no empathy and continued to downplay his actions. Christine Morgan, Priscilla's sister, testified that her sister would not have wanted Daniel to be released. Carol Gustafson, Andrew Gustafson's second wife, recounted how Andrew was haunted by nightmares of his family's murder until his death from cancer in 2014. Quote, he should never be let out. He deserves to spend his life in prison. Subsequently, a judge sentenced him to 45 years of incarceration. In 2019, a new law allowed juveniles convicted of murder to petition for parole after serving at least 30 years. Despite this, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court upheld the original judge's decision, according to the Associated Press. I'm now going to read directly from the statement of facts from the appellant brief. The court has considered the fact that Mr. LaPlante was 17 and a half years old at the time he committed the Gustafson murders. While at 17 and a half, he was still a juvenile by virtue of his age. The evidence submitted at the hearing did not reflect that at the time of the murders. While at 17 and a half, he was still a juvenile by virtue of his age. The evidence submitted at the hearing did not reflect that at the time of the murders, he displayed the hallmark features of a juvenile, that is, immaturity, impetuosity, and failure to appreciate risk and consequences. This is notable in a variety of ways. Specifically, Mr. LaPlante's criminal history leading up to the Gustafson murders reflects deliberated and well-calculated actions. He repeatedly broke into homes, terrorized families, and ultimately murdered Priscilla, Abigail, and William. His actions were goal-driven and demonstrated a desire to exercise control over his victims. 
Mr. LaPlante's family and home environment was also relatively unremarkable. While his mother recounts having a difficult relationship with her first husband, she did not think that Mr. LaPlante witnessed any violence. Mr. LaPlante described his childhood as pretty good. His mother worked hard, she remarried, and her second husband served as a father figure to Mr. LaPlante. Mr. LaPlante struggled with learning disabilities and attention deficit disorder. However, he had significant support systems in place at school and consistently tested above average intellectually. The facts of these homicides are reflected in the trial transcripts and in Mr. LaPlante's description of the murders to Dr. Saleh. Those facts clearly establish that Mr. Plant acted deliberately and intentionally on December 1, 1987, and that he did not act impulsively or out of place of immaturity. He carefully planned his intrusions into the Gustafsons' home, first breaking in on November 16, 1987, and stealing items. While he could have stopped there, he decided to return. He obtained a gun and lied to his brother's friend in order to get bullets. He practiced loading and unloading the gun. On December 1, 1987, Mr. LaPlante broke into the Gustafsons' house for the second time, carrying the loaded weapon. When he heard Priscilla and her five-year-old son William entering the house, he said that his first thought was to jump out the window, but he decided not to. He confronted them with the gun, brought them to the bedroom, put William in the closet, and tied Priscilla to the bed. Mr. LaPlante said that after he tied Priscilla to the bed, his plan was to leave, but once again he decided not to. Instead, he made the decision to rape her. After raping her, he acknowledged that he could have left. Instead, he decided he would kill her. After he killed Priscilla, Mr. LaPlante made the decision to take William into the bathroom and drown him. As he was leaving, he encountered Abigail. He lured her into the bathroom and made the decision to murder her as well. These facts reflect three distinct acts of murder carried out deliberately and thoughtfully. Finally, Mr. LaPlante's conduct after the murders confirms that he acted with deliberation. After fleeing the scene, he went home, ate, and then attended his niece's birthday party as if nothing had happened. Likewise, there is no evidence in the record that Mr. LaPlante demonstrated any youthful incompetencies that resulted in harsher charges or that his youthfulness affected his ability to work with his attorney. In fact, the court has the benefit of multiple evaluations that were conducted around the time of these offenses, all of which included that Mr. LaPlante understood his circumstances and was capable of assisting his attorneys with his defense. The last Miller factor is the possibility of rehabilitation. The records reflect that despite initial difficulties, Mr. LaPlante has shown signs of improved behavior, particularly in the last few years. He has positively engaged in many activities, earned his GED, tutored others, and ran a variety of programs and activities. Mr. LaPlante did express remorse to Dr. Soleil. The court hopes that those sentiments are genuine. However, Mr. LaPlante's recent description of the murders reflects an extraordinary lack of sympathy. The court agrees with Dr. Saleh's opinion that Mr. LaPlante has not yet been rehabilitated, and his prognosis for rehabilitation in the future is guarded. In sum, while the court cannot say that Mr. LaPlante is incapable of rehabilitation, there is insufficient evidence for the court to find that there is a likelihood that he will be able to rehabilitate. The court found the testimony of Dr. Saleh credible. After a thorough evaluation, Dr. Saleh's opinion is that Mr. LaPlante currently suffers from antisocial personality disorder, and that the Gustafsson murders were a result of conduct disorder, childhood onset type rather than any adverse childhood experiences, and learning disabilities or immaturity. Mr. LaPlante's psychiatric history reflects that he has never suffered from psychotic illness, such as schizophrenia or a mood disorder, such as bipolar illness. Moreover, he has not suffered from anxiety disorder or an impulse control disorder. Mr. LaPlante has never been treated for any significant period of time with any psychiatric medication. Finally, Mr. LaPlante was not under the influence of alcohol or drugs at the time of the murders, nor has he ever struggled with substance abuse. The court also reviewed the psychosocial evaluation of Kimberly Mortimer, submitted by the defense. Ms. Mortimer accurately points out that Mr. LaPlante has made progress during his time in prison. She also makes some important points generally about the current research regarding the development of the brains of juvenile offenders. However, the court is not persuaded that Mr. LaPlante's conduct can be attributed to any of his childhood experiences or to immaturity, impetuousness, or recklessness. 
As the court has noted, it is true that Mr. LaPlante appears to have made significant progress while in prison. His disciplinary infractions in the later part of his incarceration have been relatively minor and have not invoked violent conduct. He has taken advantage of educational opportunities, receiving his GED, and volunteering as a tutor. He was transferred to MCI Norfolk, where he ultimately was elected to take on leadership roles involving a variety of activities. And most recently, he voluntarily entered the sexual treatment program at Bridgewater State Hospital. While the court considers these facts as positives, they do not, in the court's judgment, outweigh the other factors. Finally, the court has carefully assessed the information before it in light of the recognized goals of criminal sentencing. Punishment of the defendant that is fairly proportional to the culpability of his crime, general deterrence, specific deterrence, protection of the public and rehabilitation of the defendant, and considered whether there are mitigating circumstances that would warrant less than the maximum penalty in this case. It is the responsibility of this court to consult her conscience and exercise sound judicial discretion in order to punish the defendant justly. Judicial discretion does not permit the sentencing judge to act impulsively to satisfy any personal or public desire for vengeance. Judicial discretion does not permit the sentencing judge to punish the offender for conduct other than that which has resulted in a conviction. Ultimately, the sentence imposed must be based on an individualized consideration of Mr. LaPlante's circumstances. Based on the totality of the evidence submitted to the court, the court is persuaded that Mr. LaPlante's relative youth did not play a role in the Gustafson murders. This case does not involve a single act that resulted in three deaths. Mr. LaPlante committed three distinct and brutal murders. He killed a 33-year-old pregnant mother and her five and seven-year-old children. He left a family and a community devastated. The court finds that the maximum penalty is warranted. Accordingly, the court will impose a life sentence for the murder of Priscilla Gustafson. The court will impose a life sentence for the murder of William Gustafson to run consecutive to the previously imposed sentence. The court will impose a life sentence for the murder of Abigail Gustafson to run consecutive to the two previously imposed sentences. Each sentence carries parole eligibility of 15 years. Based on the court's sentence of three consecutive life sentences, Mr. LaPlante is not eligible for parole until he has served 45 years. This case haunted me because one of my biggest fears is someone living in my home without me knowing. I cannot imagine how the Bowen family sleeps normally at night after realizing that Daniel was in the walls for that long. I would constantly ask myself what I think he was thinking of doing to me and my family, and how we got lucky that we escaped. My heart goes out to all of the victims in this case, especially Priscilla and her babies. The fact that she was pregnant and vulnerable is even more heartbreaking. As always, all evidence will be linked in the show notes as well as on our Instagram. You can find it at Murder Tapes Podcast or on my personal at Annalisa. Thank you so much for listening and I hope to see you on the next one.